Welcome back to Viewpoint. To kick off the program, I've got a great political panel to look at all the issues of the week. Joining us in Canberra is a Liberal backbencher Kelly O'Dwyer. Thanks for joining us, Kelly. Great to be with you, Chris. And on the set with me is Labor's Shadow Parliamentary Secretary, Ed Husick. Thanks for joining us, Ed. Chris, uh, g'day. First up, uh, I want to go to the issue of border protection, uh, one that we keep coming back to time and time again. And uh, I'll, I'll go to Kelly O'Dwyer, firstly, for your response on this as part of the government, Kelly. Um, we saw in the last week three boats arrive, and we've also learned of pushback from Indonesia. I Indonesia resisting uh, attempts by Australia to have boats return to Indonesia or asylum seekers from those boats return to Indonesia. After very promising signs initially, this is an indication that there are obstacles in the new policy. Well, I hate to disagree with you there, Chris, but I think what we have seen with our relationship with Indonesia is a deepening of our relationship with Indonesia. We're working very cooperatively with them. We're doing it in relation to a whole range of issues, not least of which uh, is people smuggling. And yes, we have and, seen they, and they took a couple of boats early, but, but last week, I mean, uh, there's no doubt the initial signs were very good. We went a couple of weeks without any boats, but last week, three boats and this pushback from Indonesia, they are worrying signs, are they not? Well, we've seen a reduction in the number of boats that have been arriving on our shores. Uh, we've seen a significant reduction since Operation Sovereign Borders, around about 79% or just over 79% in re reduction since September the 18th, which was when we brought that into effect. And I think that that is very, very significant. We're working with Indonesia through the Bali process. We're also working with Indonesia to be able to identify people smuggling operations as well and work with them to reduce uh, the sugar on the table that we have said for a very long period of time was what was incentivising people to make that dangerous journey and to incentivise people to risk their lives at sea. And I think we all need to take a, a very deep collective breath on this. Uh, we all need to focus on the fact that more than a thousand people have died at sea and that we need to work together in order to fix this problem. Ed Husick, uh, you, you're shaking your head there, but you supported in government very strong border protection mm. policies. Oh, I. Uh a number of things, Chris. Uh, firstly, uh, we uh, the biggest reason why we've seen a drop is not because of the way that uh, Scott Morrison structures his media conferences and withholds information from the Australian public, but rather the resettlement agreement that we had made with Papua New Guinea uh, struck a massive blow against people smugglers, and that is why, more than anything else, you're seeing this huge drop. I think there's, also, no, there's no doubt that the PNG well, second, measures have, have well, had quite an impact. There's no doubt. But, I mean, th this is a problem that well, Labor created five years ago. Then why did you leave it till the last month to, to come up with a solution? So, just if I can finish my point. So, we've had the uh, refugee resettlement agreement with Papua New Guinea, which had, as I said, struck a massive blow against people smugglers. If we had had the ability to do likewise with the Malaysia agreement and come in, in part to your... Uh, point a few moments ago, I suspect we would have seen even bigger uh, reductions over the course of uh, the time that we had attempted to have that agreement uh, made. And the reason why I shake my head is because uh, you know we're being asked now to, to uh, take a calm, uh, you know, take a calm look at things or take a breath, as Kelly uh, suggested a few moments ago, when the pressure was on to make sure that we had, uh, you know, basically stopped people smugglers from being able to put, as Kelly said, the sugar on the table. We were denied that as a result of the Coalition and the Greens joining up, and in part joining up on the lure by the Coalition that they would increase the humanitarian intake, which they then reneged the minute that they uh, got close to the election. Is it, is it politically smart for Labor to be focusing on this and critiquing uh, the new Abbott government on border protection day in, day out, when we are seeing these signs of success? Where, how much you attribute to, to Kevin Rudd's last-minute policy changes and how much you attribute to Tony Abbott and, and Scott Morrison? Uh, leave that debate aside. There's no doubt they're encouraging signs. Why wouldn't Labor would just want to back off this issue, let's see, see if it works, and, and wait and criticise the new government if it doesn't work? Because this was an exceptionally tough and remains an exceptionally tough policy area. Uh, we had tried to make headway on this through the course of the last parliament. We were denied it by the coalition blocking us and frustrating us on the, House of, uh, on the floor of the House of Representatives and then ultimately in the Senate as well. And we had wanted to see that shift for you know, a whole range of reasons, not the least of which being, and I've spoken with you previously about why I felt so strongly about this, because of the fact that it would have saved lives. And we are not going to allow uh, you know, that 
um, the, you know, the, the coalition has suggested because they've structured their media conferences differently that they're seeing results. The other point I would well, make... Well, well, the other well point that's I would, a ridiculous well, the other comment, point I would make, no, it's and I not. have to interrupt. It's absolutely but, a ridiculous but Kelly, but Kelly situation. Dwyer, you, you, you must be embarrassed about the, the focus on the media arrangements here. Now, I mean, I've got no argument with Scott Morrison being careful about what information he puts out into the public arena. We can all see the, all sorts of reasons for that, including diplomacy. But this whole focus around a once weekly briefing instead of just talking about the issues as they arise has just, has just opened the government up to criticism and suspicion, hasn't it? No, I don't think it has, Chris, but let me first respond to the point that Ed was making. It was trying to suggest that somehow there's been a dramatic change in the number of boat arrivals as a result of weekly media conferences and trying to suggest that this is somehow uh, what we are saying. Uh, that's not the case at all. Uh, the reason that there has been a dramatic reduction in the number of boat arrivals, the number of people arriving on our shore, is the fact that we have put in place a number of mechanisms that we said were going to be successful, that worked in the past under the previous Howard government, and that are now working again. Temporary protection visas, offshore processing, turning we boats around when it's safe to do so. Uh, these are all elements that are vital, not least of which as well is that we're having a coordinated approach, a military-led operation through Operation Sovereign Borders. Combined, this is having the impact on reducing the number of people who are well, arriving by boat. Uh, I, I just want to move on to an, other issues soon, but just before we do that, I want to talk about the fact that we, we are still getting mixed messages from Labor. Labor's still having the argument internally about which direction to go, even though the government in its dying days, the Rudd government, got very, very strong on border protection. Here's Paul Howes, the head of the Australian Workers' Union today on Australian Agenda. He's saying that uh, he still wants the more humane approach. I believe that we can have a, a um, humane s a solution um, that ensures that um, uh, lives aren't lost on the high seas. There you go. This is the argument from the Labor left, even that's, though he's a right faction member. That's not, but that's this, not confused at all. Sorry, well, this, Chris, is, but no, is, isn't this Paul what Howes, got Labor no, in a problem? The, the, Paul Howes has sorry, been the convener of Labor for refugees he has indeed, and has had a history of taking that approach. Exactly, There's nothing confused it, from it, Paul it, on that no, position. It, no, exactly. But isn't this exactly the approach that created the problem again back in 2008 by trying to have the so-called humane response and then we open up the borders again? Isn't it time for Labor to actually lock in to strong border protection for the, for, 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 for the ongoing uh, future, rather than have, have again a debate about softer measures? Well, we're not having that debate, and I'd ask you to find one bit of information or evidence that would suggest that we've had any confused approach on this. The, the well, party, Paul, Paul Howes, well, Paul Howes so, talking but, about a, again, a more Chris, humane approach. Paul Howes, with respect, Chris, I mean, as I said a few moments ago, you, know, you have an ex-convener of Labor for Refugees holding a consistent line that he has argued over many years versus a policy that we adopted within the, uh, within the parliamentary party as a government um, to, you know, and I would argue, have the more humane approach, which is not see people die at sea. Um, but we're not uh, at the same time. Uh, you know, we are now in opposition. We have a government that needs to be held to account. They said, for example, that they buy back boats. Haven't seen any evidence of that. They won't tell us about how many boats they've turned back because apparently if a people smuggler sees their boat coming back, we can't know about that and neither should they when they see their own boat coming back. I mean, we have a ridiculous play with words that's occurring. And I would argue again that nothing that this government has done has, other than... Um, adopting what we put forward, which they said wasn't going to work with Papua New Guinea, now they've embraced. Um, nothing that this government has done has resulted in lower boat arrivals. All right, we'd better move on because there are other issues to get across. I want to raise the NBN, and I'll, I'll put this question back to you again, uh, Ed, because you were former Parliamentary sure. Secretary for Broadband. A uh, story in The Australian yesterday revealing a, an investment bank report to the government back in 2011 that sh warned the government that the NBN could end up being a net negative for taxpayers to the tune of $31 billion and that no one would invest in this as a private company. With that sort of advice coming into government, why on earth did they proceed with it? Did you proceed with it so forcibly? And of course, I argue all along that this would be a great investment. Even mum and dad investors would want to invest in the NBN. Well, if I can pick up on one of your points, Chris, you said that uh, no private company would invest in the NBN. That's actually the market failure that led to the creation of the NBN in the first place. Telstra um, would only invest if they got a rate of return that the ACCC wasn't willing to sign off on. And uh, as a result of that, we had to take, and you might recall too, that at the point at which we called for tenders on the initial 
uh, proposal for the national broadband network, the $5 billion proposal. Telstra refused to play ball and as a result we had to open the whole thing up. So uh, as a result of 20 failed plans from the coalition in government and then um, the fact that the market couldn't fix this, we had to take that step. Now in terms of the report that you point to, um, yeah, there were a lot of reports that were around including um, McKinsey, the KPMG reports, the ones that guided the development of the corporate plan. Um, and uh, we you know, obviously take on board a whole range of issues, or did at the time. Were there reports that recommended not... this as a sensible investment? Well, I, to be completely frank with you, I hadn't seen that, that report that you reported on uh, yesterday in The Australian, but I don't you know, doubt for a moment that, these, that there were reports that existed because you'll get a variety of viewpoints uh, on the, the rollout. Should but... Bill Shorten authorise the release of uh, all the advice that the former Labor government got to see whether there was any advice uh, suggesting it was a good investment? Well, yeah, we had uh, Malcolm Turnbull say that he would uh, shine a light and he'd open up all these things and I suspect that he will uh, continue to do so as he has so, uh, done so far. The pressure's on him though. He's got 9 million premises to pass by 30 June 2016. Let's see how they're going. All I see at this point, and a lot of people see at this point, is two things. A whole lot of reviews and a whole lot of homes that are missing out on the NBN because the stuff that he said before the election, he hasn't honoured post the election. Kelly Dwyer, uh, in government now the coalition has to pick this up. You're keeping the NBN as a project, obviously changing its shape. Uh, it's still going to be a massive investment on, uh, on, uh, on behalf of taxpayers. Uh, it's still, with this sort of advice around, the potential to be uh, a net negative for taxpayers. And we take that very, very seriously. And this is one of the reasons that we called from the very beginning when the Labor Party first announced building this monopoly based on a conversation between Senator Conroy and Kevin Rudd and a couple of notes on the back of effectively a beer coaster. That's why we called for a cost-benefit analysis. And that's why your reports um, as to this current Lazard report um, is, is so serious. The government knew very, very early on that this was a highly risky project, that the net negative present value to taxpayers was upwards but, of $31 but you, billion. But you're, sti dollars. But you're sticking with it now. Uh, you're sticking with it now. Is there any chance that, that the NBN could be wound back even further by the coalition in an effort to reduce exposure? Well, we're doing a proper audit of the NBN. We're, we're going through it with a fine tooth comb and we're also going to have a cost-benefit analysis. We're going to do what Labor refused to do and we're going to make sure that the project that we deliver on will deliver value for taxpayers, uh, will ensure that the people who are most in need of service get that service first. We're not going to simply have a, a slush fund, as Labor did, to roll it out in areas where they thought that they were going to get a political benefit for doing so. We're not going to be reckless with taxpayer money. That's why we've embarked upon the review and the cost-benefit analysis that we said we'd do before the election. Well, you mentioned you're not going to be reckless with taxpayers' money, which is a perfect segue to the final issue I'll get you both on, and that is the debt ceiling and the debt issue, which of course is uh, dominating a parliamentary debate at the moment and is going to come to a head over coming weeks. Firstly, let's have a look at what Tony Burke, the Shadow Finance Minister, had to say, suggesting that there, there is a an adequate solution to this on the table right now. There's already a situation where the Senate has passed uh, the legislation that would allow the debt ceiling to go up uh, from $300 billion to $400 billion. So that's already there, that's waiting. Joe Hockey can pick that up at any moment. Kelly O'Dwyer, that's right, isn't it? There is $400 uh, billion there as a debt ceiling. That will certainly look after the short term. Why, why not accept that, take the uncertainty out of the Australian economic environment, uh, bank it and run effectively? Because according to Labor's own figures released in the pre-election and fiscal outlook, uh, the peak debt is going to be $370 billion by 2015-16. Uh, it's simply not enough. Actually. According to Labor's own figures, according to the advice that they received from the Australian Office of Finance Management, uh, we need to have a buffer of around about $60 billion as well. Yes, indeed. Um, but the argument is, I'm certain that Ed would make this argument, that uh, this is a couple of years off and mm -hmm. if required and if there's enough budgetary evidence, uh, you can come back to the Parliament for that. Well, we believe in doing it properly straight up, and that's what we're going to do. It is Labor's debt. They have burdened the Australian people with this debt. We need to raise the debt ceiling as a result of their 
fiscal incompetence. Uh, we are going to have to do that. We do it with a heavy heart. For us, it's not a target. Uh, we, we are doing it because there is a need to do it and because the advice says that. This is Labor's advice. Sure. This is the advice that's also been given to us. It, it's a limit, not a target. Ed? Uh, look, my uh, recollection is it was $370 billion by 2016-17. What we're saying is that uh, we'll approve, certainly, and we'll support uh, 400 billion, as you've already indicated, uh, right here, right now, and that Joe Hockey come back and report on uh, if we need to go up to the 500 billion. Why? Um, but a number of things, uh, Chris. They refused to release the Treasury, uh, the incoming Treasury brief, uh, to be able to provide some facts. They refused to release my EFO. Well, and, so we'll see. And the other, uh, uh, at the end of the year, or mm. well, as Santa's wiping soot off his suit. Um, and the other point is too that. Uh, uh, if they're so concerned about, because again, and the point's been made a number of times, people aren't getting the government that they thought they were electing. This is a, this is a bunch of people who said that were screaming about debt before the election and now want to actually take us up to half a trillion dollars. We inherited and, the debt. And, the, and if you're so concerned about debt, why did you pump nearly $9 billion in the Reserve Bank where Treasury because advice suggested not out. to? And hang on a second. And, and the other point I'd make as well is that uh, finally Joe Hockey admitted in Parliament last week that it was his call to do it and he's put in nearly, as I said, $9 billion. What this is about down the, the uh, downstream is uh, what you know, Howard did when he was in government, which was to reap, you know, on average, $3 billion a year out of, is in the form of dividends um, out of the Reserve Bank uh, relative to our one5 um, and uh, on average, and well, this is what it's about down the we'll track, to, we'll and, and loading up the deficit in the meantime. We'll have to wrap that up there. I know we could continue on with this. Thanks very much for joining us, Kelly O'Dwyer in Canberra, and Ed Husick here in the studio with me. There you go. Great to be with Chris. We're going to keep focusing. Likewise. No matter what pain it has caused Labor in the past, we are going to continue to focus on the carbon tax, on debt, and on border protection. Back after the break, the focus on climate.